go. Hey guys, and another one of the long list of fantastic guests uh, to come on my show. Today I've got for you Mubin Sheikh. Let me tell you a bit about him before he says hello. He's worked as an undercover counterterrorism operative for the Canadian intelligence apparatus, uh, which led to eventually a very interesting book co-authored, a uh, co-authored book titled Undercover Jihadi Inside the Toronto 18 Al-Qaeda Inspired Homegrown Terrorism in the West. He's appeared recently, and that's what triggered me to contact him, although I knew of his existence previously. He appeared recently on a Nova episode, very interesting one, called Un uh, Making an Islamic Terrorist, currently pursuing his PhD at the University of Liverpool in Psychological Sciences. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing, I'm doing. Oh, very nice. Uh, so I thought, of course, we'd start with the most obvious, which is you have an incredibly compelling personal story and a personal journey to tell. Uh, maybe we could start with, you know, that whole process and then take it from there. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm sure we'll have a, a good conversation. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Uh, my parents are of uh, Indian background from India. And um, they're Muslim and I'm born into a Muslim family. Uh, and uh, so in the 70s is when the first real um, wave, if you will, of uh, South Asian immigration uh, really started to happen. And my father at this time was, uh, was in the UK actually studying electronics uh, at a British uh, college. And uh, a Canadian company, Bell Canada, a telecommunications company, uh, offered a job. They were setting up shop in Canada. And my father uh, accepted their offer uh, to, to, to come to Canada and... Uh, he, he went back to India, married my mother, and then they came to, to Canada. And um, the Indian-Pakistani background that I come from, uh, it, what, it, what, they, what they do is, um, so they set up a Muslim organizations very early on in the early 80s, 81, I think it was. And uh, one of the first things we did, or they did, was set up a Deobandi. So a Deoband is a city in India. And there is a large seminary, uh, uh, Islamic seminary uh, in Deoband, which has produced three lines of, uh, we'll say three manifestations of Islamic practice. One is the madrasa system itself, that, that seminary type system. The second is what they call the tabligi jamaat. Tabligi jamaat is a, an apolitical, albeit conservative, uh, evangelical type movement, which proselytizes to Muslims only. Uh, basically, their their whole, uh, you know, uh, you know, mentality is we're not going to try to convert people to Islam when the Muslims themselves are not on point. So let's get the Muslims on point first and other people can worry about converting others later. And the third is a Sufi line. Um, so the Chistis, for example, the Chisti, um, uh, Sheikh Chisti was an Indian uh, a Sufi scholar. And there's a Chisti line, a Soharwardi line. So these are the three manifestations um, of that. So when I was a, a, a boy, young boy, five years old, uh, I went to what I verbalize as a Quran school, but it was really a carbon copy of the madrasas that you see on TV, that, that stereotype of boys on wooden benches, rocking back and forth, reading the Quran. and R wrote, not, wrote learning, right? Hafiz, you just memorized. Exactly. You, you can't, you're not even, you don't know a word of Arabic, you know. You're like a parrot, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that's what I did in the evening time, two hours a day, seven days a week. Juxtapose that with uh, public school by daytime, secular public school. It was a complete opposite of what I experienced in the madrasa. It was a caring, nurturing environment. Uh, boys and girls were mixing. Um, and this would lay the foundation for an identity crisis, uh, which would manifest later on in my life. Um, my father was not so strict. I mean, you know, there's a saying, you can take the Indian out of India, but you can't take the India out of the Indian. So he's, you know, he had some conservative values, but, uh, but overall, I think because of his uh, upbringing in the UK, uh, he was sufficiently liberalized. Uh, and when I got to uh, public school, when I got to middle school, uh, high school, I was now finished with the Quran school. I wasn't bullied. I wasn't picked on. We were actually the cool kids in, in high school. Um, it was so cliche, you know, the, the cheerleaders were our friends. 
and the sportos or the jocks. Well, why? Because you're, you're, you are you're have an exoticism about you? Is it that you're exotic? No, no, not it... just me. It was the, the group that I was a okay, part of. I see. Um, yeah, we were just cool. I mean, so, um, so, um, but in that high school, so I want to, I want to really lay this because the, the peer groups, uh, that I was a part of, you know, they came with their own value system. Uh, they came with their own expectations of, of conduct. Um, uh, mo- all of them were non-Muslim, overwhelmingly non-Muslim. I don't think I had, a, I think I might have had two or three Muslim friends at high school, but I still had this Muslim community that was outside of that school. And uh, at the same time, I had joined the army cadets um, in, in high school. So I was 13 years old. Uh, the army cadets is basically, it's, it's like a, you know, a cadet uh, training program for, uh, for, for kids, really. And that also came with a different value system or an additional value system, expectations of conduct, um, normalization into a particular, shall we say, militant mindset. Uh, so at the age of uh, 18, uh, or actually I was 17, I had a house party. And it was a rocking house party. My parents were out of town. And my father had told my uncle to check on the house while he was gone. So in the middle of the party, I happened to be standing outside with a friend of mine. And my uncle walks in and crashes the house party. Now, my uncle is the epitome of the stereotypical, you know, um, uh, angry or mad Muslim. Okay. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a guy that if you, uh, if you search... Um, Muslim rage boy. Okay. There's a guy who's like, he's, you know, his face is all contorted. He's got the beard. He's at some kind of rally. And this is what my uncle is. Is that, like. is that driven by his religiosity or just that's his personhood? He's an angry guy. You know, uh, sometimes the two match up real nice. Uh, right. Sometimes it's difficult to determine what it is exactly, if it's the ideology or the, the personality. So he's got the hat, the beard, the robes. He comes in, there's boys and girls. People are smoking weed, drinking beer, and he loses it. And for me, this my world started to crash. Uh, I had now defiled the home. I had dishonored the family. Uh, you know, like my uncle said, you know, people pray in this house. You know, you bring these these people here. You know, these kufar. These, these kuf- I was gonna say kufar, but yeah. I don't want I don't want to insult you. But okay. Yeah, no, no, it wouldn't be an insult. This yeah. is. I mean, we'll talk yeah. about this. Yeah. This is a. It's like a. Uh, it's, it's, I want to call them Muslim supremacists. Right. They're like white supremacists who call, you know, derogatory uh, uh, terms for, for non-Muslims. So uh, he loses it. Um, he tells me, you know, I've, I've done all these bad things. He's phoning my relatives, you know, the other uncles, because they got to gang up on you, of course. Uh, so a 17-year-old kid, seeing what's happening, I start to panic in, in my head psychologically. And, and, I, I, and I tell myself, Look, the only way, or I ask myself, how can I fix this? And I look into my cultural experience, uh, and I see that, well, I know of other people who were screw-ups, but who went with this Tablig Jamaat group um, and became religious, and suddenly people respected them again, and everything was okay. So I convinced myself through a combination of uh, conditioning, if you will, cultural conditioning, meaning my frames of reference would only go to a particular kind of, uh, or particular answers uh, uh, in, in trying to solve my issue, uh, but shame, guilt. And I decided I would go with this Tablig Jamaat to what they have as a four month program in, uh, in India and Pakistan. So you pay your own way, you stay in the mosque, you basically tell the local community, hey, look, there's this group here, the Jamaat has come from wherever, we're going to have some lectures in the mosque, some programs. Uh, please come. And uh, it's completely apolitical. So I've seen them in Israel, in fact. Uh, I've seen them all over the world uh, because they don't talk politics. So. Before, before you go on, uh, uh, just for people to know that before we started, you asked where I was from. And when I told you where I was from, you broke out into a very beautiful Jewish prayer. So oh, yeah. let, this, let this be in the record that uh, uh, Mubin Sheikh can pray in Hebrew, well done. Go on. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elochenu, Adonai Echad. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Very nice. So, 
Actually, so uh, I, when you told me you were coming from a Jewish background, I, that's it. I said I can't have this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, so, I'm smelling a fatwa on me. <laughs> so in uh, so uh, 1995 May, I go with the Tablighi Jamaat. I spent two months in India, uh, and I spent time at Deoband itself, the seminary, for 40 days, and uh, two months in Pakistan. Now, in Pakistan, what they do is, you know, they, they send you, they deploy you, if you will, to particular areas. And in Pakistan, I, I spent some time in Lahore, uh, then Faisalabad. And then they sent me to a city called Quetta, Q-U-E-T-T-A. Now, Quetta at the time was uh, a, a Taliban stronghold, and it still largely is. Um, and I didn't know that in the mosque that we were staying, uh, I had seen other people they were sitting in a similar gathering. So I actually thought they were other Jamaats that were there, other groups from the Tablighi Jamaat uh, in the mosque. Uh, and one of the things we did when we went outside and trying to talk to the local community, you know, that we're here from Canada. This is the, the first student group that's come from Canada. And so please come to the mosque, blah, blah, blah. And so as I was walking around the area, now understand, this is a guy who... He's come, okay, I don't want to refer to myself in the third person. I've come from this background, uh, all these different value systems, uh, the army cadets, I'm, I'm, I'm accustomed to being around weapons, actually, and, and that military context, and uh, adventurous um, and outgoing. And so we started to walk about the local area. And I could see uh, where we were is there was a compound where a lot of foliage was growing out of, you know, from the walls and over the walls. So as I came, I could see some guys sitting and they had beards and turbans and robes. And so I thought, oh, these are, you know, religious guys. Let me go and, and talk to them. As I came closer, uh, it turns out they were armed, um, heavily armed. Um, rocket propelled grenades, um, you know, AK-47s, other kinds of um, um, firearms. And the fixer that we were with, I could tell he started to get nervous. And uh, and so I came up to them and I, and I gave them the spiel. I said, look, in order for us to be successful in this life and the next life, we have to follow the commandments of Allah as shown by the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so they said, Okay, it's very nice. Um, but if you want to change the world, you do it with this. And he held up his AK-47. And I thought, even I thought then, you know, what a statement to make, you know. Um, and they became very intrigued. What is this Jamaat from Canada you're talking about? There's Muslims like you in Canada? I said, yeah, there, there are many Muslims in Canada. And remember, these are Taliban guys who have not left their little You're speaking patches. which which language? What what common language? Uh, uh, so I was, I was speaking in Urdu and the... the the fixer was either Dari or Pashto. I don't know what, okay. uh, but I think it's Pashto that has many um, uh, similar words in, in, in Urdu. So, so uh, they said to me, look, you know, we are fighting. Uh, we are fighting for jihad um, and against the kuffar. Uh, and this is, you know, this is our way. This is the way in which you will bring greatness back to the, the, the Islamic world. And I became enamored by them. Uh, for me, they, um, uh, you know, they manifested all the things that I was looking for. They had the militant or military uh, construct. Uh, they had the religious element as well. So in the fall of 95, September, uh, I returned back to Canada. And, and I, my birthday is September 29. Happy uh, belated birthday. Oh, thank you very much. I just turned 41, I think it is. Yeah, you don't look uh, it. You look like yeah. one of my undergraduate students. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> uh, and... So I, I turned 19 then. But what happened is I left the Tablighi Jamaat. And I joined up with guys that I had known previously. But for at that time, the previous time, their messaging didn't really resonate with me. I, I didn't grow up in a home where we were talking about politics. Uh, you know, my grandfather was actually a police officer uh, under the British in India. Uh, he did undercover operations, uh, you know. And so my father grew up in that environment. And politics and this kind of stuff really wasn't our thing. So now I've taken on this new identity. Now I, I'm seeking a new group. Is your, uh, is your family uh, surprised or are they aware of this uh, 
change in your belief systems, if we can call it that, or you kept this to yourself? No, no, it was pretty obvious. Okay. I started to grow the beard. Okay. I, I had a, uh, I don't know if you've seen a picture of me from before. Uh, I saw, but- I saw a clip of you of 10 years ago and, uh, you look differently from now. Well, yeah, there's a, there's one where like I have the big beard, yeah. black turban, long robes. You know, I look like I was like, you know, 10 years older probably. Uh, so so uh, I join up with the with a, a group of young guys uh, in Toronto that I've known about. Um, and they're basically jihadi Salafis. Now, just, you know, it's terms and I don't want people to get confused. So basically, the Salafi is sometimes it's used synonymously with Wahhabi. Uh, it comes from you know the Abdul Wahhab, who was the the founder of this this uh, if you want to call it school of thought. I guess it is a kind of a school of thought. It's a thoughtless school of thought, but we'll get to that. Um, and uh, it starts in in the late 1800s, uh, or I think it's late 1700s is when Abdul Wahhab is born. Abdul Wahhab basically joins up with Ibn Saud. And that marriage creates what we now know as Saudi Arabia. So Ibn Saud validates <clears throat> uh, Wahhab, Abdul Wahhab, and his school of law or school of thought. And Abdul Wahhab validates the Saudis as the legitimate rulers. So uh, they were they were really um, it's a really separationist worldview. Uh, it harkens back to really Bedouin culture. Uh, this idea that we need to go back to the ways of the Prophet, meaning replicate you know, 7th century Arabia. Uh, and, and we'll get into the vast number of problems that's caused, not just in the theological sense, but also in the socio-political sense. Uh, so I joined up with these guys, and they're all about the global jihadi cause or the global jihadi culture. And I use that term global jihadi culture because things like Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they're, they are all just manifestations of that that general jihadi culture. So um, I join up with them. It's angry young men, very anti-Western. And the the idea that you need to be a mujahid, uh, as you need to take on the mujahid identity. Uh, you're, the world is at war with Islam. Uh, they really believe in this perpetual state of war. I'm sure we'll get into, you know, these ancient constructs of... Dar al-Harab. Dar al-Harab, right? Dar al-Harab. The House of War, uh, Dar es Salaam, House of Peace, if, if those are the only two uh, people want to use. But a very, I mean, very bad uh, uh, way of, of living and thinking. So I was with them for a long time. Uh, I recruited other young people to that cause. Um, and uh, in 1998, so I, start, I do that for about two and a half years. 1998, I get married. Um, I actually marry a girl I knew from high school. She's Polish. She converts to Islam, and uh, and I knew her from before. And in fact, she knew me from before when I was the party guy. And then I left, and I came back like hyper religious, and that intrigued her. And that was the exotic, I think, maybe component. And so, so we get married, and uh, that's the same year that this guy named Osama bin Laden comes out with his fatwa against. Well, his I mean, he's not qualified to give fatwas, but. His fatwa, his, his declaration, his so-called legal opinion that we need to make war with the West. So we became supporters of the Taliban and then Al-Qaeda. But juxtaposing this with my marriage, this calmed me down a little bit. I, I didn't tell my wife what uh, I was up to and the kinds of ideas I had because I probably thought, rightfully so, she would flee uh, very quickly. Um, and after I got married, we actually, the last 10 days of the fasting month, I spent in Saudi. I went to Medina and Mecca. I went to Egypt. I did the tourist thing in Egypt. From Egypt, we took a bus from the Cairo Sheraton uh, to uh, through the Rafa'a border in Israel and uh, went into Jerusalem. And I had a fantastic experience in Jerusalem. Um, now, is, that you know, when, not, is that when you realize that if you look closely at Jews, they don't actually have the shaitan's horn? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, it was a. I'll, I'll give you some, some uh, examples. Um, you know, the. So remember, I still looked the part, uh, and this is before 9/11. So the Israelis aren't really. I mean, I have an Arab name, all right, Mubin al-Din Sheikh, but I don't have Arab family, and that's their concern. It was like, or are you Arab? Do you have family from here, from there? I was like, no, I'm Indian. They're like, how do you have an Arab name? I was like, I don't know. It's just my parents gave it to me. So um, 
and the experience in Jerusalem was so uh, so deep and and fulfilling. Um, you know, I my wife and I climbed uh, Masada. Uh, Masada is the the fortress uh, where uh, I guess it was initially used as a Roman fortress, and then a group of uh, uh, Israelites or Jews took it over. Not took it over, but you know, uh, started to use it. The Romans seized uh, or laid siege on it. And in the end, you know, there's a whole story where one had to basically, it was like a murder, not, I guess it was like a suicide pact because then I can understand it. They didn't want to be taken as slaves and raped and murdered. But to watch the sun rise from Masada and contemplating on these things really started to, it started to really create a big wedge in my, in my head, a cognitive wedge. That transcendence that you felt, was it very coalitional base it's making me stronger in my islamic identity or is it creating a a universal brotherhood because you are sitting there where jews did this you are sitting in israel so which of the two was being awakened in you it's a good question it's a good question because you know psychologically sometimes people will just double down if they if they're under threat from their earth their ideas are under threat they'll double down no i went the other way I started to see, wait a second, you know, this is like, I really felt a profound sense of, I don't know what it was. I mean, it's the Jerusalem syndrome, you know, sometimes people get. And also, I went to the Kotel, uh, the the Western Wall, um, and Canadian passport, you know, nobody bothered me. I was I was allowed to go right to the back, and I stayed in the back. I didn't want there to be any issues. I could see a couple of Israeli soldiers uh, positioning themselves just in case, the, you know. The, the trigger finger was getting a bit itchy. <laughs> no, you know, they, they were fine. I mean, I, I'm sure they, they understood. You know, I, st- I went to the back. I mean, a guy who's there to do anything crazy is not going to go to the back. He'll probably uh, try to do something up there. So it was things like that. Um, I was studying uh, Christianity, but for the wrong reasons, I'll admit. You know, it was to debate Christians. It was to destroy their faith by showing contradictions in the Quran. And uh, there I am outside the Garden of Gethsemane, for example, it, with a Bible and reading the accounts in the Bible. Uh, and when we went inside, uh, it just so happened that there were some Polish tourists who were there. And my wife, you know, she's Polish. She understands Polish. And they said, quick, take a picture of him. He looks like those guys who used to live here in those days. <laughs> You know, and my wife was laughing. She's like, hey, they think you're like one of the disciples, you know. So it was a really, really positive experience that I had uh, that I had there. Then I actually ended up going to India, did the tourist thing there, went to the Taj Mahal and, you know, all the went to some Hindu temples, Jain temples. And, and, and I was always intellectually driven, I think, uh, if, if I can say, I think those that's one of the key things that kept me from fully engaging in violence. Uh, to be always thoughtful about things, or at least try to be. And and this really started to open my mind. But uh, this is how the de-radicalization process happens. Just like radicalization, there are always points along the journey. And something usually will happen in your life, and you will then reinterpret those events according to your cognitive frame. Now, what is so it... Now, sorry, before you go on. Uh, what is yeah. it that allows you to have su- such self-insight uh, because, I mean, your story, I mean, right, here's your uncle that comes in, bursts in, he's the angry mu- mu- Muslim, as you, as you said. Uh, and yes, I know that that's not how it's properly pronounced. I'm Lebanese, and we would say Muslim, but okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, because someone writes to me once in a while and says, that's not how you should say it. So somebody is, at, you know, some, some white guy from Iowa is explaining to me how to pronounce the word Muslim. But okay, anyways, uh, but that, that notwithstanding, so... You know, you have very clear points that you seem to have access to that say, here is the trigger point that got me to go down that first path. Then here's the Now, why aren't other people uh, as clear in that process? Is it just because of your unique personhood that allows you to introspect and come up with these points? How do you explain this? Yeah, I know all of this is uh, a product of later on when I began to study the topic. Of, of radicalization and, and even just basic psychology. I was not as insightful and thoughtful uh, before. Before I was just going with the flow. Right. Um, so so I know I'll, I'll, I'll add to that that point a little bit more. I want to continue with the, the story here. Um, so, so 1998, uh, and there are points along the way, and this is a major point along my way out, I think. 
two uh, a few years later um 9/11 happens and i'll be honest uh it was tuesday morning i'll never forget it i was driving to work i was working for uh, uh, a real terrorist organization uh, student loans uh <laughs> was uh, customer service customer service for student loans and they 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 financial uh, jihad <laughs> financial jihad jihad al mal right <laughs> jihad al mal was right. Yeah. So uh, and you know they they processed the documents and and contact schools and it was a it was a decent uh, thing but you couldn't see what I looked like on the other end of the phone obviously but when I was driving down uh, it was just before nine o'clock I heard a plane had hit the building and the first words out of my mouth was Allahu Akbar okay wow. I I thought it was an accident in the beginning actually because one plane hits I mean. Nobody thought, well, I mean, some people did, but most people wouldn't think it's a deliberate attack. And then when the day went on and we realized, oh, my God, this is a you know major attack. And, you know, I went home during lunch and my wife is like watching the TV. And she even she even made the joke. Like, she's like, you sure you don't have anything to do with this? Because like people are phoning the house because they knew what I was about. Right. And so my my good Muslims are calling me saying, Mubin, this is not our religion. This is not what we're about. My non-Muslim friends are calling me saying, Mubin, is this your religion? Is this what you're about? Is this what you've become? So that day, I was now challenged from all sides to, to really answer to myself, what is it that I'm subscribing to? Is this really what? So at the end of it, I mean, even at the end of the day, I went to see my bad friends and they were ecstatic. Uh, they were very happy. Um, you can say they were celebrate, celebrating. And... I, uh, one of my friends actually said, yeah, but, you know, these are non-combatants. You know, what do they have to do with our fight? And there was this silence for a few seconds. And that, I can say, is the moment when I realized, no, these guys are not. There's something fundamentally wrong with this worldview. I need to study my religion properly. Because I come from that background where I didn't study Arabic. I didn't study usul, like principles of of jurisprudence or uh, of interpretation, tafsir, like exegesis. Uh, I had not studied any of that stuff. The, the seerah, which is the biographical material of the prophet, um, the hadith, which is the, you know, the oral slash written tradition. So now I said, I need to study my religion. Uh, where am I going to go to do that? So I thought, okay, I must go to our Arab country. Now, I thought of Egypt, but at the time, Egypt was too expensive. I was studying religious studies by distance education through the University of Waterloo, and I was not going to get into Saudi Arabia with a book called The Jewish Jesus, okay? Uh, so it just so happened that the mosque that my, my father actually runs the mosque, he's the, on the board of directors, there were some laborers who were building you know, the dome that we have, and they were from Syria. And they, they heard that I wanted to go and study. So one of them said, hey, I have a house in Syria that's not being used. Why don't you go and live there and stay there for free? Don't worry. You're a student of knowledge. So I said, oh, I guess I'm going to Syria. Now, Syria also plays a huge role in the uh, Islamic apocalyptic or eschatological uh, tradition, the end times. Uh, this is really what explains why so many have gone to Syria or are, or are desiring to go to Syria. You know, more people have gone in a few years to Syria than in the 10 years they went to Afghanistan uh, with, with the jihad there. So I also thought I'm going to go there. OK, if the great war happens while I'm there, you know, great. I'll be able to participate, uh, you know, and 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 uh, so I go there in early 2002. Now, a number of things happen while I'm there and I'll, I'll list them very quickly. The biggest thing is. Uh, the most important thing was that I, I came into the, uh, the school where Sufis were, were teaching. So for those who don't know, Sufis are really like the, the polar opposite of Salafis we, we talked about earlier. Uh, Salafis basically you can say, uh, or, or the, the outward legalistic, literalistic people versus the Sufis who are more internal, you know, don't miss the forest for the trees. Big picture. I don't have time to look at other people and say, hey, you're not doing A, B, and C, because I, I know that I haven't done you know, D, E, and F. So I'm not going to waste my time with that guy. 
because God's not going to ask but the me about for, that. But the former are going to consider the latter as apostates, yeah. right? That's right. That's yeah. right. Apostates, deviants, they call us all sorts of names, right? Uh, so the Sufi scholar who was there really corrected my, my understanding. Uh, you know, he said to me, because I wore glasses at the time, uh, I got laser surgery three years ago. Great decision. Uh, and he said to me, uh, we're going to give you new glasses by which to look at the world. He could see that there is a, a cognitive framing, if you will. Um, and so we went through the Quran. We went, th you know, he told me, he goes, give me your, your ideas. Where are they from? What are the verses that you refer to? And so we went through the verses, the arguments that are used. And the way that he did it, you know, he was kind. Uh, you know, he, his knowledge was like, I mean, off the charts. This guy had, I mean, not only memorized, but internalized so many of the Islamic texts and, uh, and basically showed me that my interpretations were all wrong. And I felt uh, a sense of failure in that I had wasted my life or years of my life thinking like this and being like this, and all the while, what was I doing? You know, like the sheikh said to me, he says, ask yourself a simple question. By your conduct, forget your words. If by your conduct you are repelling people from God, then you, you are not a person of God, okay? You can talk all you want. People talk very nice. But behaviors, how was your behavior? Do you help the, the random person, the random poor person? God doesn't say, you can't help the non-Muslim uh, poor person. He just says, help the poor. You know, there's no distinction made. So, so the main thing was a, a, a reframing. And this, I take this from social work. Social work has this reframing. So you start to think of the world in a new way. Uh, number two, I became very disillusioned uh, by you know, life in Syria. I mean, I saw a real police state, a real police state. You know, to nowadays we use this term in the West, um, because, you know, I am very pro uh, national security agencies, not blindly. I mean, I believe in oversight and, uh, and, you know, ethical conduct and all that. But largely, I mean, we have the best system around. I mean, that's that's the reality. So a real police state in Syria. Uh, people were calling me Taliban more in Syria than they did ever in Canada. Right. Because the Indian guy. In an Arab country, so more is in, more Islamophobia in Syria than in uh, yeah, Toronto. right, right, right. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, also, while I was there, uh, a couple of British students, uh, British nationals, uh, Indo-Pak backgrounds, uh, went to uh, through the Golan Heights with their passport up to Tel Aviv, and one blew himself up in Mike's place. Uh, Mike's place bombing in uh, 2003. It was. Um, the other guy, don't know what happened, he tried to detonate and he didn't work, I guess. I don't know if he tried to swim away, but his, he basically washed ashore on a Tel Aviv beach. Uh, also in 2003, the American invasion happened uh, of Iraq. And the, the Assad regime was sending people uh, from Syria to fight in Iraq. Now my son, now I'm married of course, I have two children by this time. My oldest son, his name is Mujahid. Right. One who does jihad. But actually, because I was so infatuated with the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, his Mujahid Yahya. So Yahya is John, John the Baptist. And then my second uh, boy, his Isa, uh, Jesus, uh, peace be upon him. So um, people, you know, they said, Abu Mujahid, Abu Mujahid, because you're now father of right. Mujahid. They said, come, come. And so I was like, look, I'm not here for that. You know, I registered with the embassy, Canadian embassy, when I when I was when I was in was in Syria, so I was there for the, the exact reasons I said I was there. So all these things taken together, largely the first thing that 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 theological context is how I de-radicalized. I there was a full cognitive shift. Um, so uh, I returned uh, uh, to Canada in 2004. Uh, the first week that I'm back, uh, the first Canadian's been arrested on terrorism charges, Momin Kawaja. Momin Kawaja sat next to me in the Quran school that I went to as a kid. So I contact the intelligence service. Uh, they basically say, well, they recruit me. Uh, I start to work for them undercover uh, for two years. Uh, one of those cases becomes a public prosecution. I then traverse to the RCMP. In 2006, 18 guys get arrested on terrorism charges in the Toronto 18 case. 
And then for the next four years, I'm in court giving testimony. But while I'm in court, I start to do a master's degree in policing, intelligence, and counterterrorism. This is where I start to discover radicalization and de-radicalization. And, and I realize, hey, wait a second, I, I've actually done all this stuff. So, um, so 2010, the, the, the court case is over. I get online, Twitter, Facebook. I discover you know, the war in Syria is happening. This group called ISIS. These kids, foreigners who want to go and join ISIS in Syria. So for 2012, 2013, 2014, and too much of 2015, almost every day I was online with a lot of these ISIS youth. Uh, in real time, I got a lot of screenshots for my interactions with them. You know why, what they claim they're doing, what they're actually, what I can, uh, in, you know, um, infer, extract from their yeah. life, why they're really doing it. Because sometimes, and I'll say this now, religion is sometimes a driver, okay. um, uh, but other times it's a passenger with other psychosocial factors as the driver. Uh, there's that interplay between ideology and foreign policy or or grievances. Uh, so, you know, ideology without grievances doesn't resonate and grievances without ideology are not acted on. But can I, can I, can I push you for the first time in nearly 35 minutes of uninterrupted sure, sure, sure. lecturing? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so let me, I'll just finish it with yeah, that. Yeah, this okay, is, go. uh, this is my online stuff, 2015. And since then I've been, I train, uh, government agencies, special forces units, uh, academics count, you know, conferences and whatnot. So, gotcha. uh, there's the. Very, very, very interesting story. Uh, so I guess two things only that I would challenge you on. Uh, and not challenge you because challenge makes it seem as though it's adversarial. Uh, one is uh, those psychosocial variables that you speak of obviously exist because nothing exists in a vacuum. It's not as though Islam or Islamic indoctrination happens in a universe where nothing else matters. So, of course, I concede that point. But yet there are 10,000 religions, and that's an underestimate of the number of religions, yet very 9,999 others, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking colloquially, yeah. uh, are, are also, uh, people are also exposed to similar psychosocial factors of various forms, and we could discuss what those forces are, and yet they don't go off and do this. So in other words, it is a, 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 a necessary and needed part of the recipe for things to happen involves adherence to Islamic religiosity. So the problem I think is, and this is what I, you know, I often rail against, is uh, this political correctness that causes people like George Bush, like Barack Obama, like every single Western leader, like Hillary Clinton, to say, look, this has absolutely nothing to do with Islam. Certainly that can't be right, and I think you and I will agree on this. And I guess the second point, is that while you were able to meet a sheikh in uh, Syria who, who allowed you to uh, navigate through those texts in a way that you came out to be a, a decent, lovely, kind, respectful human being, surely we can also agree that for tons of people who read those texts, it's very, very easy to not come to that conclusion, right? And so, and I, and I, I will ask you to, to, to opine on this issue. I mean, surely... The, the part that says, kill, 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 take a break for an espresso, kill, 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 kill. We can debate whether kill in Quranic Arabic means caress gently with the hair and do mental gymnastics and, and do 17, you know, gold medal Olympic gymnastics to come up with. No, no, it really meant only at that time, only on a Tuesday, only to that guy. And it meant caress, not kill. But the reality is that there are elements within those texts that are problematic in the context of co-living. So, well, first of all, would you concede that there is any elements in those texts that notwithstanding any reinterpretation or gentle interpretation are problematic and we have to deal with them? Or do you think that when properly viewed, it's all beautiful? And the problem is that nobody knows how to properly understand them. Okay, well, so so I, I largely agree. I'll, I'll first I'll, I'll go with the it has nothing to do with Islam. Okay, uh, I mean that's not correct, right? I mean when people say that, that is not correct. I mean it's got something to do with Islam. Uh, the question comes down that that what is what is that something? Right. So I think that that leads into the second point that yeah, if you I mean I used to read the sources like that, uh, and and I would make the argument that it really does come down to context uh, how you 
how you look at the verses. So a very quick example, chapter 9, verse 5. This is the famous, you know, uh, kill them where you find them verse, right? Kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. The sword, and, and I would, the sword verse. Yeah, the sword verse. Yeah. And I would make the argument of context. I would say, well, look, you know, it's talking about a very particular group of people. You know, it's, ta- it's saying mushrikeen, right? Mushrikeen is... You know, polytheists, right? It's 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 actually different than Ahl Kitab, people of the book. Jews and Christians are not mushrikeen. They've never been referred to as mushrikeen in the Quran. So I would I would support the con- context argument. Uh, if you look at chapter nine, it, you know, verse one, it talks about a peace treaty that was made, the covenant between the polytheists and and then it even says in verse four, the verse right before the sword verse. This does not include those people who were not deficient uh, in the contract. So it's telling you that there is a very specific, uh, a very specific context. So, but let me, I want to reinforce a little bit of your point. I don't want to just play defense for, for Islam. Because, you know, there is, um, I think one of the problems in the Muslim world, in the Muslim mind, uh, is this idea that you need to replicate the days of the Prophet. Okay, alayhi salam. Um, because in those days you had slavery. You had, uh, you know, taking uh, women captives. Uh, you know, you had things like, you know, the, the, the conquered people had to pay tribute or what in Islamic terminology, jizya. Uh, and the, I would hope, the, the sensible-minded Muslims um, understand that there are some things which just no longer apply. I mean, they've become obsolete in practice. Um, so... When you get people, I think this is an epistemological uh, problem that the Muslim world suffers from. It's this idea that, now of course, I mean, I do believe the Quran is the speech of God, and but what does that mean? I mean, that means that I believe, you know, God is speaking to a people in a particular time and place, uh, you know, and he's uh, and, and he's speaking to social norms that are are uh, current at the time. And for people to say, like, of course, I can still say, uh, you know, uh, you know, this, these are the, these are the words of God, of course. But for those who say nothing can be changed, what they actually end up saying is that God is stuck in the sixth century, basically. So right? the inerrancy and the sort of uh, uh, invariant universal properties of the Quran, you would say that is not true. And you're well, going to get you're going to get a death fatwa on your head very yeah. very quickly. Well, you know, I mean, <laughs> get ha- in line, who guys. Who hasn't exactly? <laughs> right. Like, get in line, guys. Right. <laughs> um, the the thing really I wanted to say was there are universal values in the Quran that we would hope Muslim you see this and you can live by in all times and and places. But there are some things that just don't apply anymore, right? Whether it's slavery or captives or riding donkeys to work. You know, we, we have the internet now. We, there are things that have developed since then. And I think the problem really comes down to those who are literalistic in their reading, who refuse to move away from what is said in the Quran because they think that means you're claiming you know better than God, right? These are the arguments that they'll make. They say you can't change anything. The laws never change. And that's patently false just from the, ba- the basis of you know, usul of fiqh, of the, of the laws, you know, the principles of the laws. So uh, I wanted to just reinforce that point that, uh, that that there is something in Islam that if you read it a particular way, you're only going to get a violent response and a violent output. I always use this analogy. The re- religion is like a hammer. You can either build a home with a hammer or you can destroy a home with a hammer. It's going to depend on your outlook and your perspective. And I think when you look at now, when you start to look at the the, the psycho uh, or even socioeconomic situation, so people who are born in conflict zones, you know, people who are born in places where the government hasn't invested in education. So what kind of readings do you think they're going to have of the Quran? Just a quick last little joke. Uh, In Syria, they even made the joke. If your kid sucked at math and science, it's the Jews. It's it's because of the Jews. Well, it's, it's always because of the Jews. Come on. Um, if he sucked at math and science, you sent him to theology school. Right? <laughs> right. And, and, and that shows you if, if you're using the lowest you know, level of education, what kind of things are you going to come out of this? So just the, just the last thing on this, I'll let you give because I know we're 
there's a great, I really, I love this scholar, uh, uh, Sheikh Bin Bayya. So if you were to Google Bin, B-I-N, and then Bayya, B-A-Y-Y-A-H. I'm smelling da'wa. I'm smelling da'wa. No, no, da'wa. no, no, no. You'll, I think you'll like this. All right. Uh, bin Bayya, outdated Islamic laws. All right. Oh, what, Just Google that. And it's a the, he's a theologian who says things like, listen, this idea that you got to kill apostates, get rid of this stuff. This has no relevance today. You know what I mean? Like you can, people can make the but, arguments uh, about whether it was, Sheikh, I'm not going to do that. Sheikh Yusuf al Karadawi, who some would argue is a rather knowledgeable guy on Islam, but of course he's no true Muslim, would probably disagree with that Sheikh. And I think that's the problem. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure he would because Bin Bayya is a Sufi minded and right. Karadawi is the other minded. Right. And and I will I, and I, you will see consistently why these guys who are sometimes called Salafis, because I know Salafis are very good, they're not violent, but you will see more so in that group people like this who are rigid, literalistic. Right. Whereas these guys are more like, hey, you know, we don't need these things anymore. You know, jizya and like, you know, tribute for non-Muslims or this idea that there it's Dar al-Harb and Dar al-Islam and that's it. So you know, we can so actually live together. So then you would. So I'm trying to understand from a doctrinal perspective. Are you typically arguing that there is nothing in Islamic doctrines that require reformation? It's only a question of proper interpretation. Or are you conceding that there are elements within Islamic doctrines that are problematic and therefore let's find some tools of reformation that allow us to achieve that which you're ultimately hoping for? Which of these two are you falling more on? Okay, uh, so probably largely the latter because okay. when we say that, that reform, I would say the mechanism of reform has to come from the religious tradition itself. So this example of bin Bayya, for those who study Islamic fiqh, this is what's called the maqasid-based approach to sharia, the higher objectives of sharia. So, you know, the sharia talks about protection of life, property, dot, dot, dot. And the laws that come in are supposed to achieve that objective. So if it's, you know, um, let's say, I'll, I'll give it, a, this might be controversial for some people, and so let's engage in that. Theft, okay? Now, in the Quran, it says the one who commits theft, you cut the hand of the thief. Now, I would say, okay, um, the objective of Sharia here is to protect property, okay? That's the objective of Sharia. And it's to serve as a deterrent for other people to not engage in theft, okay? But the mechanism by which that is being tried to be achieved is by cutting the hand. So I would argue that, well, you can change that mechanism. You don't need to cut the hand. You're not saying that you know better than God because God said in the Quran to cut the hand. No, you're actually using the principles of reasoning that God gave you even in the Islamic legal context. It's, it's amazing that a lot of these people, they've just not studied the religion, really, because when you say these things, they think, oh, my God, it's controversial, it's whatever. But it's like... um. You can go back centuries ago and you will read about scholars who said, no, you don't really need to cut the hand. You could imprison people. Or in the modern context, I would say, yeah, you could have rehabilitative programs for theft. You could do restorative justice. You could do community service. You can achieve the same objective by using a different mechanism. And that's what I think we need a lot more of uh, in, in, in today's environment. So those, those doctrinal points, just those, we probably, you and I, we prob I'll probably have you back uh, again on the show. We could discuss those. Uh, but I won't comment on them now, although I might disagree with them, uh, <laughs> because I want us to cover a few other sort of very practical things. I guess the first one I'd like to cover is, d can you think of a framework that we can use that allows us to fully understand, and I'm not asking this sarcastically or facetiously, I'm truly, generally meaning that, uh, the 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 accusation of you know Islamophobe you know you're an Islamophobe you're anti-Muslim and all this uh, is really uh, very unhelpful uh, when used in property. Uh, is there such a thing as uh, hatred towards a Muslim for no other reason than him being Muslim? Of course there is, and then that should be condemned. Yeah. But is there endless cases where the very reasonable criticism of an ideology uh, is labeled as anti-Muslim bigotry and Islamophobic and so on? I mean. 
Of course, it's, it's obviously a strategy used by some very nefarious groups to shut discussion. So what would be for you the litmus test that would allow us to say, you know, for example, if I say, you know what, here is, here is a prayer in Judaism that is misogynistic and idiotic, and even though I'm a Jew, I think it's, it's BS, point, that's it, end. I, I will not subscribe to this. That does not make me anti-Semitic, right? If I were to say, you know, Jews, you know, they're, they're the devil. They're to be mistrusted. Uh, they're evil. They smell. That's anti-Semitic, right? So there's a clear distinction between I criticize the content in the Jewish books versus I attacked people and discriminated against them. So what is, yeah. is that, is that your benchmark? That is, that is the test. Yeah. So, so if, if some, just, oh, okay. Yeah. If you're discriminating against people and you're encouraging people to discriminate you know, against Muslims because they subscribe to the religion of Islam, which I don't agree with, that becomes problematic. Now, you know, this is a very, it's a very, I mean, I don't want to use the word sensitive, but I mean, it's, you know, it, it, there is a, I think, um, uh, overuse of the term. I really do believe that. Uh, you know, for example, uh, when the, the um, New York uh, issued the text alerts uh, after the, you know, the, the, uh, the, yeah, the yeah. bombing um, by the guy. Some people said, oh, this is Islamophobic, yeah. you know, because you're identifying the guy's name and it's a Muslim name. And so therefore it's Islamophobic. No, it's not. I mean, what are you going to what are you going to do? You're going to put the guy's face and not his name when you know his name. So how about people, I give a position and you yeah. tell me if I am a vile Islamophobe. Ready? Sure. Uh, OK, so I think that it is very concerning uh, that we have an open door policy of immigration in the West whereby you're letting people in who have a baggage of cultural and religious values that are antithetical to our secular, liberal, liberal modern values. And therefore, even though most of the people who are coming from those lands might be perfectly lovely and uh, you and I want to sit down with them and, and have some hummus and falafel with them, uh, that doesn't mean that they don't have values that are grotesque. For example, we could know from endless sorts of yeah, that's, that's I know where you're going. That's not Islamophobia. Thank you very uh, much. He has yeah. stated. All right. Uh, yeah. Drawing any it's, links. It's normal. It's it's natural. I always remind people, if a bunch of white Christians showed up on the shores of Saudi Arabia or some Muslim country, and came in large numbers, we would be having the exact same conversation in Muslim countries. It I'm, would be, I'm liking you more and more by the minute. <laughs> I'm just honest, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's I it's. I think it's normal. It's natural. If you want, it can. It goes back to our our days as tribal cultures. So where, then, why? How do you explain the fact that some of those who are levying those accusations will be not guys in your family and of your religion, but will be the white quote liberal? They're not liberals. They're pseudo liberals. Because if you believe in liberal principles, you would be against the cutting off of female body parts. Uh, so how do you explain? Is it just internalized white Western guilt that has parasitized their brains and therefore they can no longer think? I mean, right? You very quickly, you interrupted me and said, I know where you're going. No, it's not Islamophobic. It was very clear to you. Why isn't it clear to them? I think, you know, people, they, they have a difficult time separating uh, ideas from from other ideas so you can have racist people who don't like non-whites who don't want non-whites in their in their communities that's one thing and they can latch on to an argument which is perfectly legitimate so this is what I think people have difficulty separating sometimes what they're doing is it's a genetic fallacy right, right. you know my math teacher was a bad person she told me two plus two is four therefore that's wrong right. and so I think a lot of people engage in that and Look, it's it's. Look, I, I'm very much on the the, the refugee side. I mean, uh, look, the reality is is that look, not everyone believes the same thing we believe. That's a reality of of human nature. I think uh, uh, if you're coming from certain Eastern European countries, really, you're you're gonna have you know homophobia or or very anti homosexual attitudes. Look, that's normal in those parts of the world, right? And now, all we can do is I think encourage them that listen, this is where we live. These are the kinds of people that live here. You need to accept that and you need to understand that. I don't think that's racist to say that. I think if you do it in a, in a meaningful way, in a proper way, not to berate them or to belittle them, 
but to inform them and to educate them so that they're not, oh my God, what is this? You know what I mean? These people are holding hands. I'm seeing skin, you know, where I come from. So there is a way to avoid that. But I think it's the manner in which it's being done. You, you do have some people who are, you know, uh, and look, I'll be honest. I mean, I can understand why they think the way they think. People who have these objections. Uh, it's normal. If, if you see the kinds of things that happen in certain places, the value systems uh, with or by which they subscribe or to which they subscribe, you know, enables certain um, actions and activities. It's perfectly reasonable for people to have apprehensions in that regard. So let me it's continue. Not, I'm sorry. Let me continue with yeah, that. Yes, sorry. Uh, so Salim Mansour, do you know who that is? Yeah, I know who that is. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so let me let me sort of channel my Salim Mansour now. Uh, but based on how you responded, maybe I shouldn't. But uh, no, so, that's, that's fine. So, so uh, for those of you who don't know, Salim Mansour was on my show. He's a professor at Western University who famously appeared uh, in front of a House a parliamentary committee where he said, "Look, I'm I'm of that uh, religious background, and I think that we need to curb uh, immigration to Canada from folks coming from those areas, precisely for the reasons that you and I have been discussing." So let's say now I, I so let's see if this is Islamophobic. So we, we both agreed on this first example. Let me push it a bit more because you were saying, well, if we could teach these people in a nice, meaningful way that these things are different. But the problem is there's also pragmatic reality of demographics, right? There is a reality whereby once you get a sufficient number, I mean, and this is straight from evolutionary game theory, you know, how many people do you have of one type versus of another type, right? right. And that's how you, 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 you know, you, you, you model population dynamics and evolutionary game theory. So, you know, when, when the number of people who, who hold some of these nefarious views are at 2% and 3%, it's not as bad as when they're at 8% and 10%, and it's not as bad as when they're at 20 and 30%, and it doesn't take Einstein to get this. So from my perspective, right, uh, I can say as somebody who comes from Lebanon, I, by definition, know more nice people who are uh, Muslim uh, than most people will ever meet. As a matter of fact, almost every Muslim that I've ever met has been very nice. So let's let's put that aside. But on the other hand, I also know that the more a society becomes Islamic, I can pretty I can predict with quite a bit of accur accuracy that anti-Semitism is going to rise. Now, when they're at four percent, it's not a problem. When they become at fifty percent, hey Jews, time to start packing your bags and so on. So. And, and homosexuality, and freedom of speech, and freedom of consciousness. So, well, first of all, would you agree with that general statement? Or do you think that we can have an, a massive increase of Islamic immigration, and this only leads to more freedoms, and more liberalism, and more tolerance in the society? What, what yeah, this is, uh, I mean, okay, so I largely do agree, right, right off the bat. I mean, um, if you're, if you have people who subscribe to a particular uh, interpretation of Islam, um, uh, one that is uh, almost fascistic uh, in its in its outlook. Uh, I mean, you're only going to get one one output from that, really, and it's going to be an increase in fascist people. Um, I think. I mean, what this is one of the things that Canada had to deal with in in our own refugee resettlement issues. For example, we really didn't bring in single males. Right. Uh, you know, we, we largely inclined towards families or people that had ties to people who were here. And there's a reason for that. I mean, there's a reason why, I mean, it, the, the issue is really not of unfettered. I mean, just letting anyone and everyone in. That's, that's, it, that's madness. It really is madness. Uh, because no place, I mean, you would want to, uh, if you look in your own home context, you're not going to let a known, you know, drug dealer or murderer or rapist in your house. You, you're going to, you, be, you do your own little vetting of who you invite to your home. You generally have an idea. So I think what we need to do is when 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 people are brought uh, and this kind of educational system is there and you have a society that supports them, then in fact you will you won't necessarily get just a replication of what they've been doing in their home countries. They may they probably will internalize these new value systems. They'll realize. Hey, this is actually, and it will take time for some of them who have grown up in a particular environment to change their learned behaviors, right? It's not a, well, as soon as you cross the border, suddenly all your views change, right? right. Sometimes there is a process that, that has to be followed. I think that's really what it comes down to. Now, the bigger problem, and I, and I don't want to spend too much time on that, it's really the, 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 the disaster that's happening in Syria. 
um, where are these people going to go? I mean, they're literally getting on boats, uh, so many boats, so many people, uh, and and showing up uh, in Italy, in Greece. And, How about and the moving. Gulf states? Well, that's the thing. Well, hey, the Gulf, that's a very good argument. I think, you know, the, what the Gulf states have not done, right? I mean, most of them are being held in Muslim countries, you know, Turkey, Lebanon, Iraq, even Pakistan, uh, Jordan. I mean, millions are being held in those places. The vast majority are in Muslim countries. But again, the disaster is so big that there are so many people that now we're just dealing with the consequences of that conflict. And either, I mean, it seems to be either we let them in or we close the gates. And if we close the gates, well, basically we're saying let them die, let them drown at sea, you know, let the Russians carpet bomb and destroy people, women and children. And it's like, you know, where is the middle ground in that? The middle ground in that is still tens of thousands of refugees, right? Even if you if you don't just open the door to all of them or close the door, you're going to let a significant number in. So it's a bad situation all around, you know, and I think all these, uh, I mean, look at what's happening. It's it's breaking European societies from the inside, uh, even in Muslim societies in, in Lebanon, where, you know, you have refugees who come and people there are like, hey, uh, they're going to work for less. That takes away jobs from us. We may have to pay more taxes. This is a normal, natural uh, thing. This I'm, is not. I'm glad you raised this, actually, yeah. because it's not just a question of, oh, it's the Muslims coming in. It's a question yeah. of these huge waves of folks coming in where just economically, socially, educationally, yeah. it's a huge problem pragmatically. Forget well, the about cost, the, the cost. Even right? the cost. And, I mean, so, yeah. so I'm glad that, I mean, I, I definitely do sense, uh, you know, uh, nuanced thinking in, in, in the way that, and I wish more people had your courage because... It's radical. Well, it's yeah. radical, right. No, because, you know, it's, it's very frustrating because... You know, you try to have honest discussion. Now, I, in my case, frankly, given how open I am in my positions, but I think very measured and reasoned, I really actually don't get the type of hate mail and so on that one would expect you might otherwise guess, get precisely because I think I'm measured. But yet I see other folks who are within this landscape who now are afraid to open their mouths because lest they might be accused of being phobic and racist. And I think we need to get rid of this. We need to complete, right? Let your words ultimately be judged in the open air, right? You know, if you say something horrific, then people will, it'll be there forever to be judged by others, right? But when you stifle, when you self-censor, I mean, I get folks, for example, academic colleagues, famous colleagues who write to me privately and say, my goodness, you have such courage to take on these issues. I wish I had your courage. I say, well, what are you afraid of? Well, I'm afraid what people will think. I'm afraid that people will think I'm a bigot. Well, then you know what? You, you're a coward, right? So how can we get people to grow? I mean, if, if there's ever been somebody who has testicular fortitude, it would be you. And I'm not trying to just give you empty compliments because you probably have 20 million death fatwas on you for the work that you've done with with the Canadian Security Services. Is that correct? Would that be a fair... Uh... Yeah, you know, I get... Uh, you I got a lot of them, uh, especially on the ISIS, uh, on the uh, ISIS on the side. ISIS front. So. so here you are, right? Uh, you know, you, you're, you're a practicing uh, Muslim. You, you take your faith seriously. You're putting yourself out there. Uh, somebody, some crazy guy could come and... Uh, I'll say Darwin forbid, since I'm not strong on belief, but let's call it Allah forbid or God forbid someone might come after you. Yet you go out there because you're compelled by truth more than anything else. How can we bottle that testicular fortitude to everyone or to most people? Is is there a recipe for that? Look, I think what one thing that really has helped me is the the um, you know a harmonious approach to existence. You know, I think it, this is where people are going wrong with. Look, people are going to have different views. I mean, if somebody said to me, look, I think you're full of shit. Uh, I think your religion is bunk um, and your prophet was an imposter. How about that? What are you going to do about that? And I'd be like, yeah, you know, that's what a lot of people thought, even in his own time. Right. You know, so, I mean, is it going to, it doesn't affect my faith. You're not going to not let me get on the bus or anything, right? You know, you can have those ideas. I think it's, this is where the line is. You should, you should. At the end of it, you should be able to have a cup of coffee or lunch or whatever. Physically have, you know, manners with each other. You don't need to, you know, that's why I don't take a, a, only against ISIS do I take that hostile anti-approach. But 
for others, you just have to accept that, look, people have different views. That's just how it will always be and it always has been. And, you know, just have a good attitude in trying to, if there are problems, let's try to fix those problems. Let's try to actually, okay, we're not going to get anywhere, I can tell you. Like, I've seen the, the anti-Muslim side of things where it's like, we got to bash Islam and ban Islam and that's the only way. And it's like, look, that, good luck with that. That will never happen. You will never destroy Islam. I mean... That's my view. I just like, don't even go there. You're not like, let's actually work these things out. There's definitely a solution. Can you apply yourself to implementing that? That's that's what it comes down to. Here's my solution. You tell me if, if I'm off. Uh, believe in whatever you want in the privacy of your space and your conscience. Don't ever impose it on someone else. And in the practice of your religiosity, hurt a third party. As long as you do that, all bets are off, do whatever you want. The second that you infringe one inch of what I just said, we've got major trouble. And I don't owe you any leeway if you infringe on my rights. Does yeah, that yeah. sound fair? Absolutely. Okay. Let, let me just quickly use that example of the, the girl in Montreal who you know, uh, that she was wearing the hijab. Oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. she had, I mean, the, the teacher thought that she might have headphones yeah. on. Now, look, I support the right for people to wear what they want or not wear what they want. I don't believe you should force a woman to put it on. I don't believe you should force a woman to take it off. Okay. Um, and, but here's the thing. The ears are not hijab. Right. There's nothing to say that you have a right to cover your ears. If you accept that, okay, you believe you have to cover your hair, well, your ears are not your hair. But see, even if it were, even if the first sentence in the Quran was, you must cover your, cov ears. <laughs> cover your ears, and if there is an exam in college in Quebec, you must refuse it. That's the first line in the Quran. I yeah, don't right, give right. a damn, therefore yeah. you're infringing on no, the secular right. space. Then, then that's right. Of okay. course. I, I, I do subscribe to, I'm really, it's like a state-centric approach, not too much state-centric, but... Yeah, look, you're you're in a school. I mean, you're doing an exam. You know, the teacher thinks you might whatever. Some people have said, okay, you can. You can be, you know, uh, 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 accommodating and fine. You know, go get a female teacher if you want. Now, th this is, again, you know, it's problematic because what if they're all busy with their own teacher, their own students, yeah. right? Maybe we don't have time for this, right? Or maybe have another female student check it, right? A well, trust, some. There are ways to, to, to try to accommodate, but, you know, I, I do accept that, you know, um, sometimes it becomes a little too much, right? Now, there's also a flip side to this. I want to make this argument. Sure. People do need to maybe read the Charter of Rights and Freedoms sometimes, because I hear a lot of this, you know, immigrants are imposing their ways on us. But in fact, that's actually not the case a lot of times. A lot of times they're just trying to get the same rights as everyone else because they're being discriminated against. And, and I, I don't like hearing this. It's like, oh, why do these people come here and do this? You know, the big niqab debate, right? The, the, the woman trying to, you know, like, it's like, you know, her identity has been verified by somebody inside already, okay? Because this, the, the ceremony is a public event and she doesn't feel that she needs to cover her face in public, I personally don't believe that Muslim women need to wear a veil. I personally believe that we live in a day and age where if you look at, let's go back to evolution or fusiform, uh, you know, we judge threats by looking at people's faces. No kidding. Right. And so if a person's face is covered, people will default to fear because that's, you know, the, the self-preservation mechanism. I, I get that. I've, right? I've, I, I've, I I've used that exact that. argument yeah. when arguing against the, how I feel against the niqab. Exactly. Sure. But here we are in a system where it's like, you know what? You want to cover your face. You want to tattoo your face. You want to put piercings on your face with chains from nose to ears. We don't care. Right. You know, and that's the attitude that we've taken. And, and it should be applied equally across the board. I'm with you, buddy. Okay, so two, two final questions. Uh, the last one will be, tell me about any projects that you're working on. But hold on, so I'll give you a chance to think about it, that you're working on that you'd like to promote. So hold that thought. Uh, but I guess I always like to, if possible, end on an optimistic note. How do you view, as somebody who obviously has worked with the Canadian security apparatus, who, who has been enmeshed in those societies in Canada, uh, we could look at it from a Canadian perspective or look at it from a more global perspective. Do you, do you see 
that uh, this friction that is currently happening between, let's just call it, I, I know we don't have to call it this way, but between some elements of Islam and the West is something that eventually will will hit the right place in the pendulum and it'll be just a point in, in history that we can look back to. Uh, is it going to improve? Is it going to worsen? What's the trajectory like in Canada and globally? Okay, so first on projects, there's nothing really that uh, I I'm, I'm really have to promote other than, you know, I, I would just say look into Sufi Islam. There's my yeah. down point. Oh, boy. Um, oh, boy. Here we go. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, and, and uh, on the, the second point, look, I, I don't know how optimistic I can be, uh, to be honest. Um, and I'm, I'm just doing it on the basis of cause and effect. Um, it's one, uh, one way to look at it is, look, human civilization is all about conflict. It's all about the effort of trying to de-escalate and trying to make find solutions to those conflicts. If you look at all the way back in history, I mean, wars are part of our nature. Discrimination, racism is part of our nature. You know, uh, authoritarian rule and things like that. It's, it's So when you look at the world today, when there are these military conflicts, this is a big, big thing. You know, again, I mean, maybe we'll, we'll discuss this a little bit more, but when you're looking at ideology and foreign policy grievances, I mean, look, the U.S. is bombing the crap out of a lot of Muslim countries. It, it makes a lot of people angry. I mean, that, that plays into the whole larger narrative. Now, when you have wars and you have large, large numbers of people ripped out of their homes, forced to go somewhere else, and then the people over there don't like those people, this is not a good situation. Uh, this does not seem like it's going to produce a positive result. And if anything, uh, the the end result is going to come down to us and what we make of it. We can either, I've seen both kinds of people. You have malevolent people who are, who are just like in Batman, you know, when he says, you know, some people just want to see the world burn. And then you have good natured people. So I think we will write that next chapter. We will write that future. Depending Who's on we? What Who's we? We Canadian? as human beings. Human be okay. Okay. Yes, yes. You were asking about Canadian yeah. versus yeah. international perspective. Yeah. The international perspective, we will write that future depending on what approach we take. The confrontational, hostile, beating down approach, I've been there, okay? It doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work. It makes people angry. It creates negative energy. And then when people then interact with other people, they just, they're shooting off that negative energy. I, I don't think that works. I like the positive approach. You know, we were talking about hugs and kisses for terrorists. Right. No, so, some of them do need hugs and kisses, but others, they need to be they need to be eliminated from the earth. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, uh, determine who needs to be where. See, uh, I, I think, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I was going to add just to add, and then we'll we'll close, and hopefully we'll have you back again on the show at some future time. Uh, for me, the most important fundamental thing is to be able to maintain the most fundamental of rights, which is freedom of speech. As long as that right allows me and you to sit down, as we just did for an hour and a half, and talk, we might disagree on a few things, we might agree on a lot of other things. As long as that mechanism exists, then I think the battle of ideas will always veer us in the right direction. The problem, what worries me the most, is that I'm seeing a growing. I mean, it's not as though we've become a totalitarian society yet, but there's a growing uh tsunami of forces that are making people afraid to speak some of it is due to our own doing right uh, you know westerners feeling guilty and therefore they get into all this political correctness stuff in other cases it's because uh, islamic groups that are quite nefarious who try to shut down you know care and these kinds of guys but for whatever reason we've got to push back these guys to allow guys like you and me to feel fully comfortable in having these conversations and then let the best ideas win, right? I mean, if Sufi Islam is the way to go, then you know what? If we put it in the arena of ideas, it will eventually win out, right? Right. But the pro right. right. So I think if we if we protect secular, modern, liberal societies, then I think hopefully we should be uh, okay in the long run, and our children, my children, and yours will have a happier future. What do you think? Yeah, you know, look, too much of anything is not good, right? Everything in moderation, right? Whether it's even secularism or religion. You know, I, I had this idea, this thought that it's it's ironic almost that it's secularism actually protects religion. Exactly right. Uh, 
but but religion doesn't necessarily protect secularism. Uh, you could have, if you have a reg, religious secular state, I could I can go with that, right? I mean, I, I have all kinds of crazy ideas of you know legal autonomy for different groups, and I mean, as long as you you know pay your taxes and you know behave, uh, you you should be able to do what you want. You know, um, I think there's that that basic level of look, I'm gonna believe what I believe. You know, there's this big issue. I don't want to go on, but one one guy wrote about how, um, uh, you know, he supports uh, gay rights. I mean, blah blah. He's a Muslim guy, and people are like, oh, you know, Allah Billah is a Muslim guy, and they were like, oh, you can't do this, you know, blah blah blah. And the guy was saying, yeah, but even in that classical Islamic context, you had Christian areas where they sold wine, they raised pigs. So I mean, and you got a problem with gays? <laughs> like I mean, right. so they they this is where you start to get that fascistic uh, religious element. And those fascist elements, whether they're secular or religious, they need to be kept in check because they will not produce uh, uh, productive societies. They won't produce harmony. They'll just produce conflict, confrontation. And that just it just leads to more conflict and confrontation. So absolutely agree with you. Uh, open dialogue is the only way forward. The only way forward. So you, uh, as we end, at one point on Twitter, and we spoke privately via email, you were concerned about our chat. Have I assuaged all your concerns? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And and you know what? Look, I, I always say I spent four years under cross-examination by lawyers, okay? Right. Uh, I don't have tough conversations. Like, if people are like, yeah, it's like, yeah, I know you believe that. And, you know, it's not going to change my faith or make me feel, oh, my God, I got to get you to believe what I believe. Right. No, I expect you and others that I have conversations with to not believe what I believe. Right. I'm not... I mean, that was my joke. It's like, what? We're not, I'm not here to have a discussion with myself in an echo chamber. So this is the thing. People need to get out of their comfort zone, right? Challenge themselves. And, and the, the, I think it's the Aristotle quote. Uh, it is the sign of an intelligent person to entertain a thought without necessarily accepting it. There you and go. this is what people are very uncomfortable doing. So we need, I think, to do more of that. Well, if you ever come to Montreal, dinner is on me. All right. All right. <laughs> Uh, nice talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Stay on the line. Uh, this uh, chat will hopefully be up later today. Thanks, guys.